Good morning again and welcome to this third plenary session. Uh, my name is Helma van Lierop and I'm from Tilburg University, which is a little bit up north here in the Netherlands. And I guess you expected this morning uh, Karen Groneen to introduce our uh, plenary speaker, but uh, she asked me to excuse her because unfortunately she had to go home uh, due to family circumstances. So, as a member of the scientific committee, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Gudrun Marcy Bunke to you, uh, although I'm convinced that uh, she doesn't need any introduction for most of you. Gudrun Marcy Bunke is Professor of Modern German Literature with a special interest in the acquisition of reading skills and media competence at the Technical University of Dortmund in Germany. She is also Director of the Research Center Youth, Media and Education and a member of many different international and national organizations. She has published widely on the acquisition of literary competence in relation to media competence from early childhood on to adolescence. She also focuses on the perspectives and potentials of professionals like, like teachers and librarians. And by doing so, she combines theory and practice of reading research and reading promotion. It is her belief that in uh, read that's we should promote reading uh, right from the start of children's lives and she believes that uh, that that should be in active participation of parents in the literary education including reading books reading at the computer and reading a newspaper listening to music attentively or watching a movie and understanding it she believes in reading promotion in combination with other media in her keynote lecture, Children's and Young Adults Literature in a Digitized World, Cultural and Political Preconditions for Literary Education, Gudun Marcy Bunke will challenge the general assumption that the new digital media foster global participatory cultures in which media are widely accessible and in which users also are producers. And it's my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Bunke. Thank you very much, Helma, for the very kind introduction. And good morning to everybody. I have to fix this little microphone. OK, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, originally, I had planned to start my present presentation with this, well, was this Wittgenstein um, quotation in the title. The limits of my language mean the limits of my world. Although it no longer appears in your materials, I'm resurrecting the quote for the presentation because it calls attention both to the media philosophical but also to the socio-political dimensions that I want to address in my remarks. I will return to that later. But first, let us have a look what I'm talking about this morning. First, I want to invite you to rethink reading with me. Afterwards, I will focus on some research findings as regards reading worldwide. Then I want to introduce a concept of participatory reading and uh, discuss the prerequisites and limitations afterwards. But first, um, I want to invite you to rethink reading with me for our digital world. Hence, in what follows, I will not speak about children's literature as book literature and treat media culture as something that exists alongside and independent of books for children and youth, but I will talk instead about stories for children and adolescents that should be read in a digital world. Although I will not focus on any particular story. But stories itself should not be read because they can be accessed in a certain medium, whether as ebook, film, or co collaborative writing block, but because they offer the children a chance to make the world their own and to participate 
in culture. So let's rethink reading. It will be, as you surmise, all about reading in a larger sense of the world. What does that mean, a larger sense of the world? So what does reading actually mean? In their media historical and media sociological research, the two German cultural scholars, Jan and Aleida Assmann, made clear that the written word is not the only means for transmitting culture. Rather, from early on, various forms of media and practices developed to carry tradition and innovation forward. Ritual and orality constituted the first stage in media evolution. Practices that conveyed, both through celebration and rituals, understood as media practices, a rich set of traditional formulas and messages, even if limited by individual human memory capacity. Then came the great leap forward into literacy, at least for us, the transition from memorized and spoken language to written language represents a major step forward. Still, Plato himself, in his Phaedrus dialogue, assigned no importance to literacy. Indeed, he thought of writing as wanting compared with the memorized singing of the rhapsodists. For to use writing, we need knowledge of a semiotic system we have to be able to apply it, receptively as well as productively. And only based on this art, this know-how, as we would say today, and by means of this medium, can we acquire what has been handed down and which we ourselves as authors can process for posterity. In the new age of literacy, culture is preserved by means of a non-personal medium, the carrier medium as memory. This truly was a revolution. I can experience what other experienced before me, transcending time and its passage, without having these storytellers physically in front of me. Reading, as a diachronic form of handing down, takes its place besides synchronic listening. Reading ability, however, is more than just another form of cultural reception. Reading also means taking a stance, precisely because reading and writing demand new competencies from the reader. Reading, as an act of acquisition, is likewise an expression of the wish to take an active part through knowledge and expertise in passing on culture. It is in this sense that the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu speaks of a habitus that is acquired as part of socialization. Reading must be learned. The reading habitus thus describes acquisition practices and skills of literacy. However, today, and here we are in a new phase of medial evolution, no less specular than the leap into literacy, Literacy as alphabetic system is no longer the sole nor the most important means of cultural mediation. Reading, consequently, is no longer bound only to the written word. Reading becomes a skill for decoding symbolic codes that transcendent literacy. The younger generation communicates in a variety of such symbolic systems of meaning or codes written, visual, and musical. And combining the symbols in a montage signifies another level of meaning, quite similar to our language syntax. Just as literacy cannot exist as an art form without the technical foundations at once of writing technique, papyrus and paper making, printing and bookbinding, today's new comprehensive reading competency too goes hand in hand with a technical revolution, digitization. It allows the, world dis the worldwide distribution and reception of semiotic systems. The children and youth communicate via audiovisual digital media, which simultaneously permit nearly unlimited storage and transmission, and which, via digital access to the media text, also clear the way for permanent 
creative reworking and reformulation of these texts. Unlike that media skeptic Plato, I view this media expansion, this leap into a new mediality, neither as regression nor undesirable development, but as the right way forward. And like it or hate it, we cannot ignore it. The world of digital media is changing how we introduce our children to the social memory of our time. The conference logo, at first glance so wonderfully reminiscent of a QR code. This, by the way, is the real co QR code of the IRSEL, the right one. I created this. Could be interpreted in this particular way. A human surrounded by media, by interacting directly only with the book. The other media are accessoires. They come into play after reading. I would rather conceive of the com conference theme of children's literature and media cultures as being much broader. Therefore, I will not talk primarily about books, which also still exist in the media culture, but instead of contemporary digital mediation of storytelling, of cultural experience and memory passed down in fiction or non-fiction texts to the target audience of children and youth. <coughs> For all that, traditional reading, the deciphering of alphabetic codes, remains the object of global reading research. And you see I'm already heading towards my second point, reading worldwide research findings. And here we must acknowledge that establishing this fundamental cultural technology has not yet succeeded globally. In South and West Asia, in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa and in several Arab countries, the percentage of youth able to read lies between just 60 and 90 percent. In the respect, the poor countries are the ones lagging behind. Reading is thus also socially indexed globally. Cultural participation varies with the society's economic resources. This high significance of reading as a form of cultural participation is also evident in the continuity of school attendance. As might be expected, dropping out of school correlates with poor reading ability. This observation permeates the international reading performance studies for Germany, but not only there. The higher the family's education attainment, the higher is reading performance. Family education level, parental educational ambitions and family financial resources still are decisive for the younger generation's education biographies in general and reading competence in particular. On the other hand, economic barriers, barriers seem to matter less than it comes to digital media. Prices for the digital resources that enable social and cultural participation even in less developed countries, keep dropping. And the market for the erstwhile expensive desktop computer is collapsing in dramatic fashion. The USA and Asia are registering a drastic drop of 12 to 22% in sales of classic personal computers. In contrast, global sales of tablets rose 67.9% last year. A look at the low literacy countries shows that Africa is the continent where most investment in the media market is being made, despite the general recession. There are countries already in both the North and the South where the rate of ownership exceeds 100%. This is the first iPad produced from an African company. Regardless, it holds true for Africa. In digital or analog, the sub-Saharan region still brings up the rear. The media may be changing, but 
even with the new media, the fundamental opportunity for cultural participation remains particularly the same, for good or ill. For now, this means that digitization is not going to change the opportunity for participation quantitatively overnight. We still observe a correlation between the gross domestic product and reading or media competence and media endowment. Now I start with participatory reading. But wherever opportunities for participation do exist, they change reading competence qualitatively. While formerly the reception of text was all that mattered, today it's increasingly about their production. The real novelty is not the digital storybook, but instead the potential for reshaping and the reading process for the self and for many other readers. If the opportunity of utilizing the digital world exists, the process of reading itself will become different. At the start, I invited you to rethink reading. Henry Jenkins, the American media scholar, has an exciting idea in, his, in this regard. Completely in line with demands of high quality children's and youth literature, he calls for complex reading materials. However, these are not to be exploited in an individual reading marathon or a rather intellectual elite, but in a form of collective reading experience. Jenkins assumes that the texts are influenced by many factors in the course of being created and that they feature numerous internal references and are rooted in their, at the time of being written, contemporary society. This, of course, is not a new idea. Texts have contents that are consciously planned by the author, but there are also possibilities for associations that spring from the recipient's constructs. This is what makes reading always an active, creative process. Why then, so asked Jenkins, should this process of active text acquisition be confined to a single person? Why not construe the interpretations and references collectively? In this way, you do not get just an individual, one-dimensional or at best two-dimensional model of understanding, but one in multiple dimensions. For this, Jenkins relies on collective intelligence. He also advocates the validity of associative reading approaches. This broad collective access can change reading to such an extent that we no longer entirely follow a story's stream of consciousness. However, at the same time, the individual learns a great deal about a text's influence on the present, its reception offers and the various contexts and interpretation in this reception. In this way, the reader creates new opportunities for finding his or her individual way of reading within the collective and for profiting from the construction capaci capacities of others. This, by the way, ensures cultural transmission for especially demanding texts with their many discontinuities. In this battle, the individual can no longer prevail. By this, the centrifugal forces of cultural communication are turned around. The diffusion of all-day communication and cultural communication of synchronism and diachronism turn into an implosion. Being digital, becomes, uh, being digital, reading becomes a process of cultural exchange and communicative participation. I grant that many reading experts perceive this position, which I just sketched using the example of Henry Jenkins' convergent reading, as a challenge. For all those who are convinced that the book is the most important medium of all, at all times and in all places, this approach will hardly seem likely to bear fruit. Unfortunately, 
as shown by the analysis conducted during a study we um, made in Dortmund on cooperation by libraries with schools and daycare centers, this applies to many preschool staff, teachers and librarians of both genders. Nevertheless, I venture to champion such thesis here for a look at the conference program convinces me that there are many glimmers of that new way of looking at reading. That I'm not alone in holding the conviction that we must rethink reading in the digital world and that we cannot stand pat on our book-based notion of reading run on text. Just as writing fundamentally changed speech, just as conceptual literacy function in a completely different way than conceptual orality, just as literacy in form and content represents a separate code, so also do other rules and allowances apply to digital reading processes. In the world of Henry Jenkins, but each new medium also disrupts old patterns, requiring us collectively and individually to actively work through what roles different forms of media are going to play in our lives. And I advocate so emphatically for this new perspective on reading because I believe that we cannot respond didactically in any other way to this insight. Our students, girls and boys, already are reading this way. And yes, they are reading, although we do not measure their way of reading with our PISA testings. This pick topic that interests, they pick topics that interest them with all their convergent signifying digital potential. They are not interested in any particular medium per se, but as the medium that lets them find what they are searching for, be it entertainment or information. That offers the classic book an opportunity, but also strong competition. Children and adolescents pick up books not because they are books, but because they like what the books are about. Subjects of interest may also include the actor, the merchandise toy, the fan site, the movie, or a YouTuber's creative new adaptation. And they can also say what they personally think of it and come up with their own posts, make their own reading of it shareable with others. This is how readers and receivers turn into authors and producers. Therefore, Axel Burns uses the word pot utzer. What I'm pleading for here, my dear colleagues, is that you may regard the new ways of reading and forms of media used by youngsters as skills and not as deficits. I'm calling into question the simple linearity of current literature receptions in school. Yes, it is okay to cut up poems in schools. Why not? Why should I not put hyperlinks on a page of Moby Dick or Robinson Crusoe or Inkhart or the tributes of Panem or Snow White as long as they make sense collectively and are individually motivated? Some may answer this way. Because this quasi playful handling of text, which uh, Jenkins develops uh, this matrix about, um, this playful handling of text contributes nothing to a comprehensive understanding of the text. Because it does not begin to let the students experience the flow of immersive reading. That may be very well right. Yes, this way, way I will perhaps not experience Melville in the same way as individual readers of previous generation read him. But Melville is dead. We are not obliged to read his or any other book in a particular way. And who will read Melville, Moby Dick today, if not collectively? Our students won't. Maybe it is more important to find out something about the intellect of the person who is reading it with me in class or at the library the setting of didactic priorities at the, very last, at the very least has changed. This needs to be understood as a cultural opportunity, not just as the decline or fall of the West. Something in the expectations that texts have fixed 
exhaustive interpretation potentials and should be read in a certain way, evokes Adorno and his critique of a culture industry that willy-nilly distributes art and kitsch to everyone, regardless of the recipient's competencies. Adorno might have agreed to the opinion that there is a right way of reading a text, as he was of the opinion that there is right art, original art. But Adorno assumed that culture belongs to a social elite and is elitist itself. This is quite different to what Jenkins want to proclaim by this reading concept. The Jenkins approach of collective interpretation is not that conservative. Yes, he advocates collective reading of complex literature, but not since this belongs to an understanding of an elite, but since complex literature consists of more empty spaces to fill with individual ideas. Jenkins doesn't argue out of a perspective that focuses on the piece of art, but on those who read. Reading for him is a creative process, and just for this reason he promotes complex and diverse literature that offers the discontinuities and connection points for a collective reading experience. It doesn't necessarily have to be canonized by children's literature experts, teacher or librarians. And I think uh, referring to the uh, speech yesterday of Junko, um, he might would have um, had a positive view on creating apps for even that very nice children's books you remember with the cloud and the, uh, the truck and the single person staying in the desert. Um, if you think how many empty spaces there are, what happens to the cloud, what happens to the truck, um, will the cloud become darker, will the cloud disappear, uh, will the truck turn round, will there come another car. So we ask our students to make up movies in their minds. And now we have the technical opportunities to create these movies in reality on a screen for them. So these are great opportunities that digitization offers. The point is, and here I strongly agree with uh, Junko, um, most of these apps are not creative in that way. They are simply uh, well, scanning the picture books as one-to-one, -one, but this is not using the possibilities of the new medium. This is now interactivity, and interactivity is not just popping up uh, a certain thing for didactic purposes. But you can, you can offer children a possibility to make up their own movies they have in mind, what we want to stimulate by reading. This is the, uh, what the digital world offers the children. Children's literature and digital media are now opposites. The one is content in the form of children's story. The other, an inexpensive communication tool for transmitting any desired amount of content. The main problem at present is that we still have asymmetries in user skills. Children today are digital natives who grow up with these devices and know how to operate them, them intuitively. Many of those who teach reading today cannot yet handle digital media and regard digital media at best at the sum total of traditional media. The new features of digital media, however, reside in their distribution potential in multiple simultaneous options for access in the communicative functionalities and in global networking. Reading children's literature in Africa and Amsterdam, in Atlanta and Samara, being in touch with image and sound over international platforms, already conveying in preschool via Skype how literature is being read or self-produced, this does not replace the hermeneutic process, the live local reading discussion, but it extends them. And it let those who can themselves bring little to the table take part and benefit from others. It is critical for the education system that teachers, librarians and educators of both genders be brought up to speed on how to competently so supervise children using this media 
inclusive of opportunities for creating in their own digital space. We have a generation gap here that may be wider than the differences in reading competence among countries. Jenkins makes the point, the skills, practices and dispositions students are encouraged to develop are filtered in school through a system designed for an outdated world. Youth today is growing up with a digital habitus, so long as it has the opportunity for access. Peer group pressure undoubtedly contributes its share. Reading promotion, especially in early childhood education and in the libraries, has to catch up here, discover for itself the opportunities offered by the digital world and ramp up both technical and didactic competencies. We have our work cut out for us. Referring again to Bourdieu, social capital grows along with cultural competence in using digital possibilities. Children can network all over the globe just as easily as locally, regionally and nationally. They learn to discover new human and institutional perspective outside their own immediate home surrounding, even in Africa. The necessary foundations are also already in place. For instance, UNESCO sponsors numerous initiatives that support digital networking processes technically and logistically. It does so especially in countries where reading education falls short of total success in eradicating illiteracy. Books are expensive, less durable than digital offerings. Social institutions and companies generously support the process of global digitization. Even if the technology is not yet available fully, the new way to think about reading does not necessarily require digital media upfront. But digitization's potential dovetails with this type of network, networked thinking. Jenkins again, we may be able to teach participatory mindsets and skills even in the absence of rich technological environment. As I conclude here, let me return once to Ludwig Wittgenstein's The Limits of My Language Means The Limits of My World. For Wittgenstein, language was also always a form of life. The rules of communication, of synchronic hearing, as well as of the classic diachronic and the new synchronic writing, are what shape, extend, and limit the view of our whole world. And this whole world, in the meantime, has gone digital. What it means in this digital age to limit this world and to cut it off from the global stream of communication, we can see in the example of China. The use of Google blocked, computers prevented from connecting to the internet because there lurk freedom of speech and freedom of communication. However, the new language of digitization will not be locked out in the long run. It enables democratic potentials worldwide, beyond national borders and governments. Think for a moment about the videos of the Arab Spring. Without this digital source, we would perhaps not have found out many things. Without this grassroots digital communication, it would scarcely have been possible to achieve political openness. We, too, here at the Children's Literature and Media Culture Conference, this advocacy group for children's and youth literature, cannot simply acquiesce in digital borders. Search prohibitions and surfing controls at most are acceptable only in the early stages of internet use by minors. But access must remain open for the adults who supervise children's digital learning process. Publishers and authors could assist here in alliance with other institutions and live up their social responsibilities by offering greater opportunities for accessing their texts. It costs hardly anything to set up this access, but restricting it costs a great deal in terms of lost learning, reading and writing potential. An open, creative culture of sharing could alter the opportunities for children to hear, 
see, read and co-create stories. And if to many kids reading from traditional paperback books might not be cool, the use of digital media is cool for them from early on. Among our four-year-olds, as our study in Dortmund pointed out, 30% are already online, often unsupervised, which should give us a pause. Two years old, meanwhile, are using texting on cell phones, smartphones or tablets, also sometimes guided by a digitally savvy and educated generation of young mothers and fathers, which should be cause for optimism. But not all young people are children of well-educated digital natives and early adopters. Reading is much too important to leave it to the chance of having educated parents. What we need, therefore, is a new alliance. The alliance of all those who want to stimulate children's and young people's imagination, imagination through stories. The alliance of all who are prepared to use today's lingua franca, namely digital mediality, as the appropriate idiom for this. And finally, the alliance of all who have seen the sign of the times and will not stand for it, that adult digital illiteracy draws an impenetrable border between the world of tomorrow and our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much for your attention.